Good evening. Uh, my name is Ben Tafoya. I live here in Reading. I spent nine years on the board of Selectmen and, or the Select Board as we say now, and uh, several years more than that actually on town meeting. Um, it's my pleasure to host one of our uh, quarterly conversations with State Senator Jason Lewis. Um, welcome um, to Reading for the evening. Thank you, Ben, and thanks uh, for uh, uh, hosting our show. Good to be back with you. That's great. Um, so the formal legislative session um, ended in um, July, um, but it seemed to have been a very busy period mm -hmm. for the legislature. Mm -hmm. In addition to the budget, there were a number yes. of other important areas. Um, perhaps you can touch on some of the things that you think are mm -hmm. sort of most significant uh, of the work that the legislature concluded. Yeah, so we did finish up the, you know, the two-year legislative session, generally wraps up at the end of July, although the legislature still does meet till the end of the year. But it was very, very busy, um, uh, especially in the spring and, and summer. Uh, we passed major legislation um, dealing with um, climate change and uh, to continue to pr promote more renewable energy and offshore wind development. Um, we passed major legislation dealing with economic uh, development, continuing to, uh, you know, uh, grow our economy, create, um, you know, uh, new job opportunities, particularly in fast-growing fields. Um, we also passed uh, legislation uh, dealing with uh, gun violence, um, automatic voter registration. I know we're, uh, sorry, see you're wearing your <laughs> I voted a sticker. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, there's also legislation dealing with. Um, uh, issues around working families and uh, uh, wages and benefits uh, that I think we'll, we'll, we're going to talk more about. There was sure. also significant legislation dealing with a uh, range of health care and public health issues uh, like the opioid epidemic and conti continued efforts to address that. Um, and um, yeah, those are just some highlights. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, and I know that you chair two committees um, for the, the legislature and that's where you know, much of your work outside mm -hmm. of the work you do in the communities um, is, is focused on. Um, and there were several big issues that were um, resolved in a comprehensive fashion mm -hmm. um, at the end of the legis legislative session. So maybe you can talk to us first a bit about the new minimum wage law. Uh, absolutely. As you rightly point out, there were several uh, big issues that were out there that were potentially going to be on the ballot. You know, uh, two weeks from today, uh, we're, we will have the election, and that was going to be on the ballot. So there was a lot of work done. Um, I, I, as the Senate chair of the Labor Committee, I was the lead uh, negotiator from the state Senate, and then Representative Paul Broder, who's nearby in Melrose, was is the House co-chair. So we worked very closely together on on a lot of these issues. One of which was the minimum wage, and so. You know, we had a long uh, process over about a year talking with um, all the stakeholders, you know, members of the business community, large businesses, small businesses, um, members of the Raise Up Coalition that was putting forward the ballot question, um, other, uh, you know, legislators, experts on the minimum wage, and all of those folks. And together kind of worked out an agreement, um, which is going to raise the minimum wage gradually in Massachusetts from $11 an hour where it is currently to fifteen dollars an hour in five years and um, you know that's very significant because that will increase uh, the take-home pay for uh, uh, it's estimated close to a one million uh, people uh, working families in Massachusetts um, that's going to help them you know pay their bills and is also going to pump more money into the local economy um, we work, you know, did listen carefully to the concerns of businesses, particularly smaller ones, and that's why this is being phased in more gradually, and it does create certainty, you know, for our businesses as to what the expectation is for, for the minimum wage going forward. That's great. Um, and so one of the other issues sort of uh, related to that trade-off mm -hmm. that uh, many members of our community have to deal with, which is between personal life and work life, mm -hmm. um, particularly for new parents or when a family member gets sick. Um, so how will yes. this new paid family and medical leave law mm -hmm. work? Absolutely. I'm really glad you brought that up because that's something that I'm, I'm very excited we were able to get that was, um, you, you know, worked out through the legislature, in the legislature. That 
This issue of paid family leave was also one that could potentially have been on the ballot, and that would have not been ideal because it's a very complicated issue, and um, it really is important to consider a lot of different perspectives in kind of trying to design a paid family leave program. You know that can work for workers, for employers, you know, for the state economy. And again, once again, Representative Broder and I led a, a process uh, over um, really more than a year where all of the stakeholders were you know, together. We met um, every few weeks and, um, and where we ended up with legislation that passed the legislature, Governor Baker signed it back in June, um, will make Massachusetts uh, one of only six states that has a, um, a comprehensive paid family and medical leave program. And what that means is that um, everyone um, will be able to have access to um, a certain number of weeks of, of partially paid leave. You don't get your full salary, but you get partial wage replacement um, for things like birth of a child. That could be for either the mother or the father to take some time off work to bond with their new baby. Also adoption of a child. Um, very serious illness that, that a person has, uh, you know, their own illness. Or if they have a, a very close relative that is dealing with a, a very serious illness or injury, you know, cancer treatment, something like that, once again, if they meet certain eligibility criteria, the person will be able to take the paid time off work. Their job is protected, so they can, he or she can come back to that job. And this is like a social imp insurance program. So kind of like unemployment insurance or Social Security, it spreads the cost across. So it's a very modest uh, impact on, on every single person. Small businesses are going to be exempt from any additional payroll costs. So that's, you know, that's important. And we believe that this will be a major selling point uh, for, for Massachusetts. When you have young um, you know, people graduating from some of our great colleges and universities and looking where to settle, we believe this is going to be a real selling point for Massachusetts. We'll be the only state in New England, uh, one of the only ones on the East Coast, that has um, uh, a program like this. And, um, and, and it's going to you know, make a difference for um, you know, several, you know, millions of people, literally, in, in Massachusetts. It's always great to yeah. see Massachusetts be a leader on these kinds of issues related to the quality of life of the residents. Definitely. That's right. I'm, I'm, that's why I think this is particularly uh, excited about this, this program. And by the way, it's not happening immediately. It'll get rolled out over the, over the next couple of years. Which is an important yes. point. Yes. yes, there's time to, essentially for our business community especially, to adjust. And to build up a little bit, I think, of reserves in the insurance fund. Exactly, yes. that's right. You have to sort of have a, a, enough of a, a balance in the, in the fund, in the family leave fund, before benefits start to be paid out. Great. And there's also a lot, I should add, Ben, it's important to people to know, there's a lot of protections in there to prevent against fraud or people you know, taking leave when they aren't entitled to it. You know, there, there, there's important steps someone has to go through in order to take you know, medical leave or family leave, because we want to ensure the integrity of the program. Great. Uh, another issue that you worked on um, in labor and workforce development um, has been discussed for quite a bit of time mm -hmm. related to our um, tech industries and other kinds of, of industries in Massachusetts where many workers have been asked to sign non-compete mm -hmm. agreements. I know mm -hmm. I have personally yes. a number of jobs that I've had um, as is my wife. Can you tell us about mm -hmm. the reforms that were put yes. in place this year? Yes, uh, really pleased about this, the progress we made here. This has been a, um, a personal issue for me, just like you. Um, I've had to sign non-competition agreements in my pre previous life when I worked in the high-tech industry you know, before I ran for the legislature. And for those watching at home who don't know what these are, they're basically these uh, agreements that people, uh, workers, are forced to sign either when you take a job or sometimes even when you've been working at a company for a number of years. And it basically prevents you from going to work from for any other company that, they, that, that, that your employer deems to be a competitor. And that can be a very broad definition. And so in ma for many people, this basically can prevent them from earning a living. And um, you know, whether they leave uh, voluntarily or involuntarily, it can prevent them for six months, a year, two years from you know, getting employed in their chosen field. And that, I believe that's very unfair. Personally, I would like to see us uh, abolish non-compete agreements entirely, which is what California has done. Um, but that's, that's probably a bridge too far right now in, in, in our state. There's a lot of opposition to that in the business community. But what we were able to work out um, is, is still a significant uh, step forward. And in summary, 
for lower wage workers, they will no longer be subject to non-competes. So employers will not be able to force lower wage workers to sign non-competition non agreements anymore. For higher wage workers, which will include uh, most workers in the tech industry, for example, in healthcare, they will still be allowed, but now they're going to be limited. They have to be limited in duration. They have to be limited in scope. Um, they are, um, workers have to be notified that they're going to be having to sign one before they accept a job. So there's an, uh, important protections there. And most importantly, perhaps, if you are subject to a non-compete agreement and you are therefore not able to work for, uh, uh, say, six months, you are entitled to receive a partial wage replacement during that period. So that helps the worker and also will be a disincentive for companies to, you know, to um, excessively use non-compete agreements. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your work on that. Um, and you also chair the Committee on Public Health mm -hmm. um, in the legislature. And there was some important work done in this area um, as well. Um, and, you know, in the community here, we've been working for a long time on um, issues related to addiction and opioids mm -hmm. yes. um, uh, abuse, it, and it's a major problem across the state. Yes. Um, so what happened this session to help mm -hmm. us address these problems? Yes, um, uh, this has been a major, major uh, concern for all of us, you know, at the state level and the community level for our health, our hospitals, our law enforcement. We are, I mean, the good news is I think we are bending the curve on the addiction crisis. Uh, fortunately, we're seeing a decline in the number of overdose deaths. Um, uh, Narcan is, is widely available now and, and is making a big difference. We've also significantly reduced the prescribing of uh, opioids uh, un, you know, unnecessarily when they've been excessively prescribed. That's helping. We've taken a lot of other steps as well. This most recent legislation that we worked on um, very closely with Governor Baker, it's been a real strong partnership here between the legislature and the governor, governor's office, um, is focusing on, um, we've done a lot to improve treatment options, but what this legislation does is it focuses more on, on, on I, the other two ends of the spectrum, which are prevention and recovery. In terms of prevention, um, what we're doing is trying to focus a lot more effort and resources on um, prevention in schools and in communities like the uh, like ARCASA, for example, the work that they're doing, which is one, very important to support those efforts so that we can help those um, who are at risk of using addictive substances to get you know to, to not start using or to get help sooner. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know the reality is that addiction, is a chronic illness. It, 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 it's a chronic mental illness. And like any chronic illness, just like diabetes, um, you, you're never 100% cured. You need to uh, continue to receive support. So being, um, getting support in recovery is really, really important for somebody who is you know, in recovery from uh, opioid addiction. Same is true for gambling addiction or for alcoholism. Yeah. So um, we're going to be doing more around recovery coaches and recovery centers. And uh, one thing that's um, very pleased about is we added additional funding that I pushed for in the state budget um, for um, adding a number of new peer-to-peer -peer recovery centers. And in fact, we're very hopeful that one of those, um, we will get the, um, is a competitive bidding process, um, but we're very hopeful we're going to put forward a proposal to have a recovery center in Malden. And oh, because right now there's nothing in this whole area. There's one in Boston and there's one in Lawrence and nothing anywhere in between. So we are very hopeful we'll, we, will, we will secure that funding and we'll open a recovery center. And these are places where they're non-judgmental. They don't provide clinical ser uh, services, but they provide support. Most of it is peer support for those who are in recovery. So you, there's a lot of um, support groups, wellness groups. Um, help with resume writing, help with finding employment, you know, getting back into the workforce, because if you've been struggling with addiction, very often you've not been in the workforce, and other services to help people, you know, to stay sober and to get, get back to living a healthy, productive life. And peer-to-peer -peer recovery centers started in Massachusetts, uh, anywhere in the, you know, in the whole country, and uh, we're trying to expand them. That's great. Well, I can... See the passion with which you address this issue. You mentioned Malden, so just a brief note to folks that you're the state senator for the 5th Middlesex District, which includes the communities of Malden, Melrose, Winchester, Stoneham, Wakefield, and Reading. So, um, Excellent. I'm yeah. impressed that you were able to name them all. <laughs> um, 
And uh, sort of one of the other areas that you've mm -hmm. been working on um, quite extensively, I know, is um, uh, youth tobacco use yes. and vaping protection. Mm -hmm. Um, and you scored a major victory mm -hmm. um, this year with a bill. So maybe you can explain a bit about that. Yes, and these are, these are all interconnected. You know, a lot of times with our kids, you know, they don't start with opioids or heroin. You know, they start with alcohol. They start with marijuana. They start with, uh, with, with tobacco, with vaping. And as uh, people um, watching at home may or may not know, um, the latest um, strategy from the tobacco industry uh, is uh, is electronic cigarettes, which is known as vaping. And uh, it's an epidemic in our um, schools. That we're seeing them all over our high schools, all over Reading High School, all over our middle schools. You know, these things look like little USB thumb drives, uh, the, the latest uh, e-cigarettes. They come in flavors like watermelon, peach, you know, uh, cotton candy. Kids love them. They think they're harmless. The reality is it's just another way to deliver nicotine and they're highly addictive and there's all kinds of other chemicals in there because they're not even regulated at this point really by the FDA. So we passed a new law um, which actually builds on what Reading's already done at the local level and thank you to the Reading Board of Health for their leadership here. Uh, it now will require um, any, anyone who wants to purchase tobacco products uh, to be 21 years of all age or older um, and that includes vaping. So we'll have uh, the same age for buying alcohol, buying uh, uh, cannabis, and and tobacco products. So that will really help with the messaging to teens that these are not these products. You need to wait till you're an adult. And uh, we also, in this new law, for the first time ever, define vaping as a tobacco product. So that means wherever you can't smoke cigarettes, like schools, restaurants, workplaces, you you won't you're not allowed to vape either. And that's going to make it a lot clearer for a lot of businesses and schools to, you know, make it clear to students and 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 you know patrons in restaurants and workers that, you know, that you need to not not uh, you, it's not okay to be vaping in there. Great, that's terrific. Um, you may have noticed that I'm wearing this little um, sticker I, here. I did. <laughs> yes. It so. says I voted. <laughs> yes. So um, we're actually taping this today, October 22nd, which is the first day. The early voting period. Yes. Um, when you were um, first our state senator here, um, the mm -hmm. legislature passed um, some voting reforms, yes. um, and um, that effort um, has continued through. Maybe you can talk a bit about yeah. that um, and what we've been great evolving towards. Lo here. Love to talk about that, and thank you for voting. <laughs> and uh, and yes, so for folks who may not know, they're still not used to early voting. Um, the election uh, is on November 6th, as always, a for a Tuesday. But from today, what's today, uh, October 22nd, 22nd through November 2nd, you'll be able to vote uh, early, which means you can go to the town hall, regular hours. And I think there's going to be some weekend hours, too. In most, right? most communities do. They should weekend. check the website for the town, and it to gives the sure. specific hours. Yep. Right. Make yep. sure to check the website. But um, you'll be able to go and vote early. You don't need an excuse. It's not like an absentee ballot. You can just go. This is, I think, a really important thing because you know, election day may is not convenient for everyone. You know, you may be traveling, you may uh, be working late, you you know, you may have a disability, and it's difficult for you to get there to the polls. Early voting makes it so much more convenient. So I'm very glad that, as you rightly said, uh, I think it was now three, four years ago, when we passed a law to update some of our election laws, we added the option, um, well, we added the requirement for early voting. And um, there have been questions about how to pay for that, and uh, I know you've worked on that that issue, and um, we've have made sure in the budget that it is um, uh, that communities are reimbursed, you know, for any additional costs uh, for early voting. The other uh, thing we did um, more recently uh, was to pass a new law um, regarding automatic voter registration. So we do have hundreds of thousands of people in Massachusetts who are, could be eligible to vote but just aren't registered. And automatic voter registration will make sure that those those folks are registered, and it's um, we'll have a process that will be um, you know it will make sure that it's secure, uh, so that um, uh, you know we can uh, obviously make sure that only those who are eligible to vote can vote, and um, that we believe once that gets implemented starting next year, we will also have more people um, who are now registered to vote, and uh, and then uh, hopefully will actually go ahead and vote because the goal here is to expand you know access to our democracy and make it you know easier and more convenient for more people to, to, to vote that's great 
That's great. Well, we like to see those those numbers. And we had about 5,000 people who mm -hmm. used early voting here two years ago um, in you know mm -hmm. in Reading. So yes. it was extremely popular. And thank yep. you um, for that. Um, another sort of important public health issue um, that the legislature has worked on um, relates to our aging population. Mm -hmm. um, and you're an advocate for the Alzheimer's and uh, Dementia Act um, yes. that passed. Um, and what does that law do to help yes. um, the afflicted and, mm -hmm. and their families? Yeah, I'm, gl I'm glad <laughs> you brought that up. As the um, uh, as a Senate chair of the Public Health Committee, I've long recognized that this is a, another public health epidemic that uh, we're you know, rapidly facing, which is as our population ages, we are seeing rising rates of Alzheimer's and dementia, and I'm sure everyone who's you know who's watching the show either has someone in their own family or knows someone you know who has gone has dealt with Alzheimer's, and it's a it's a terrible terrible illness, um, and uh, very hard not just on the person who has the disease but also on their family as well. So um, it's been a real goal for, for a while now to try to see what could we do better as a state to support um, individuals with the illness, to support families, to do a better job at um, uh, diagnosing the disease because we don't do a good job diagnosing it. Um, so we worked closely with the uh, Alzheimer's Association and um, they provide wonderful services you know, for, for families. And they had some good ideas about ways that we could strengthen our efforts. And that's what this law does. It combines a number of different ideas. It will require the state to put together one comprehensive state plan that co combines all the different disparate efforts we have underway throughout state government, throughout our healthcare sector, um, nonprofits, to have one coordinated plan. And that's good. The work on that has already begun. And then it's going to require much more training for um, medical providers and for people who work with the elderly to identify this, the uh, signs of Alzheimer's so that people can get diagnosed sooner. Um, there's a big problem today. I was shocked when I learned this, that a lot of times, even when people are diagnosed, they're not told that they have Alzheimer's, um, and the family's not told. And, and so this law will uh, require greater disclosure of that while still respecting you know, people's um, uh, privacy rights, of course. Um, so that's important. And then finally, there's going to be a lot more support and services provided for caregivers. So the Alzheimer's Association, we, we signed the bill. Governor Baker was there signing it. It was in ceremony. It was very nice. And the Alzheimer's Association said that you know, they work all over the country. And they said, this is a model law. Um, that's great. And they've already gotten inquiries from other states um, saying, hey, how'd you do this? What could we co do something similar? So we're excited to see Massachusetts being a leader. That's great. Ho hopefully helping a lot of people. Uh, um, terrific, as always. Um, and uh, anything else that you wanted to share with folks? You know, I've got some good local news, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, because all politics is local. So uh, we are um, sitting here in October, and good news. Everyone knows that uh, Route 28, Main Street, is in bad shape and ha needs, uh, has needed to be uh, repaved and fixed for some time. Um, for those who don't know, um, it's a state road. It's, uh, so Massachusetts Department of Transportation has jurisdiction. Um, so the, the legislative delegation and the town, we've been pushing MassDOT to make this a priority. Good news is they, they have allocated the funding. It's actually a several million dollar project. And they have put it out to bid. So we expect starting um, early when the construction season begins next year, Route 28, both south of downtown Reading and north of Red downtown, um, will get completely repaved and rebuilt. So it's, it's, it's not just repaving. There's also going to be improvements to some of the sidewalks and some improvements to some of the intersections. Um, so that's going to be a pretty big project that uh, hopefully will make it much safer not just for um, cars, but also for pedestrians and other forms of uh, modes of transportation. Well, I, I know the town will be excited about that because we've been yep. advocating for this for yes. uh, you know, for several years, and we understand it's tough to get the proper positioning on the, on yep. the list. So thank you for... Yes, yeah, so we're, um, we're pleased that that's moving forward. Yeah, for your, for your work on that. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time together I'm here today. Any last thoughts? That you want to get. I would just say folks should follow your lead and uh, go <laughs> make sure you vote. Yep. You know, regardless of what, what your party is or what candidates you like or don't like, 
the main thing is vote. You know, we live in a world today where we, you know, we cannot take for granted um, that we are a democracy. Um, you see too many places around the world that people are fighting and dying to, to have the right that we have here. And so please, everybody, you know, take advantage of early voting or vote on, on November 6th, but uh, please get out and vote. Well, thank you very much, State Senator Jason Lewis, for uh, the time you've given us today to, to talk through these issues. And we look forward to getting together again in a couple of months and talking about perhaps what the new year will bring in the, in the legislature. Sounds good. My pleasure.